As the markets suit up for a week of central bank decisions, I'm joined by Stephen Pope to discuss what you should be keeping an eye out for. Steve, with epic fines being handed out to some of our biggest banks, the flash cash saga continuing and talks seemingly breaking down among finance ministers in Riga over the Greek situation, is the market taking today's lack of action as a bit of a sigh of relief? I think we could probably look at it that way because there really is no pressure upon the broad markets today. We're waiting for economic data, we're waiting for other announcements in the week, so Monday is a little bit of a soft pedal. But I do think if you look at the way European equities are trading in this morning session, it's been generally positive. The U.S. futures are also showing uh, that same direction. So I think that the overall thrust of markets is that they'd like to trade higher or bond yields lower when there's nothing to cause any degree of uncertainty. But that may well change as the week goes on. Japan's Nikkei moved above the 20,000 level for the first time in 15 years last week, but things aren't exactly soaring on the economic front. The Bank of Japan meeting is being cited as a non-event this week, but do you think there is any room for a surprise? I would say that if you want to find any shock revelations about what the Bank of Japan are up to, one's actually got to start digging quite deeply into the data. A lot of data mining is required because at the current time, the argument about abnomics, the, uh, the three arrows and so on, is it really working? I think there's been quite a lot of pressure from the government on the BOJ to be a heavy intervention machine. So almost sacrificing their independence uh, on the altar of making abnomics work and pushing Japan forward. Uh, my sense is that they have been buying vast amounts of the Japanese stock market through cash and ETF holdings. So they now have just around about 1.5% of the entire market cap of the Nikkei. That puts them to be the largest uh, individual holder of Japanese stocks above some of the life insurance companies who were the traditional titan holders there. Uh, it also can be found that on the days when one has seen that the Nikkei or the Topics has opened to the downside, around about three quarters of those incidents have seen the Bank of Japan coming in as quite an aggressive buyer to try and push the market back into the green. Thursday is expected to see Russia's central bank follow up last week's comments that the ruble rally has run its course with a 100 basis point rate cut to 13%. However, some analysts believe a cut of as much as 300 basis points could be on the card. Do you agree with the ruble forecast? Yes, I think that we sometimes with this rally of oil have overlooked the correlation between oil and the ruble and it's still running an R-squared of about 0.93. So any movement that the oil price has is going to have an effect upon the ruble, but generally now we're looking at the broader economy. We're seeing that um, revenues have fallen in ruble terms following this rally. We're also finding that the sanctions from the US and European Union are biting quite hard. There has been a collapse in some of the revenues coming through from oil and that's been spreading through. And we mustn't forget that Russia needs the oil price at around 110 to make its budget plan work. We know they're already curtailing back some of the space programs, so some of the more peripheral uh, banner projects are being pulled back because they cannot afford it. And on that basis, I think you're going to find that the central bank will be under quite a lot of pressure to bring rates down again. So I would be thinking of 200 basis points would be the minimum we should see. With UK GDP and a slew of euro data on the agenda, what other currency pairs would you pick out with the potential for this week's biggest moves? I'm actually not looking too far away from things centred around sterling because at the moment what we have is such a tight election. No one can actually say how it will be after May the 7th. And my worry for sterling is is that if, as looks to be likely, Labour become the largest party in terms of seats but don't have an outright majority, and they are obliged to either go into a formal coalition with the Scottish Nationalists or run a supply and confidence type of arrangement with them, I think you're going to see that sterling is going to be undermined and there will be a short-term period where sterling, the FTSE, uh, will fall, Guilt yields might rise because of extra borrowing fears. So I think at the current time, I would probably nip out any profits I've got, say, on euro sterling, because that's been working quite well for sterling for a while. Uh, certainly, I don't think the sustained strength of sterling against the dollar is going to be uh, carrying on if we have this uh, hung parliament, which is probably likely to lead to a Labour-SNP scenario. 
Stephen, thank you for your insights. Great to speak with you. Viewers, for a closer look at Sterling, click back for today's forecast with Jessica Walker. For me and for now, though, it's goodbye.